And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate, where the motion being debated is the U.S. has no dog in the fight in Syria. Remember, you voted before the debate, and you will vote again once after the debate, after you have heard the arguments, and the team who has won more percentage points of your support well, when the debate is over, will be declared our winner. Now on to round two. Round two is where the debaters uh, address each other directly and also answer questions from you in the audience and from me. We have two teams of two arguing out this motion. The U.S. has no dog in the fight in Syria. Graham Allison and Richard Falkenroth are right, fighting, arguing in support of the motion, no dog in the fight. They argue uh, that uh, Syria just does not represent a vital U.S. interest, that the U.S. has no options before it that can lead to a desirable solution or a solution that would actually improve the problem, that there is no dog to pick in that fight, that the opposition fighting Assad is so fractured uh, that it's difficult to know who should get the arms, and a lot of them are people who would not end up being our friends. They say this is not one where the U.S. should be leading. Their opponents, Nick Burns and Nigel Schonwald, say this is one where absolutely the U.S. must lead. The U.S. cannot sit this out, that it has a moral and pragmatic imperative to get involved for humanitarian reasons, for political reasons. They say that if Assad wins, our allies in the region are really going to be in trouble. And they say there is a political process already in place that represents the dog that the U.S. can ride on this and should ride all the way. They are hopeful that it will ultimately uh, produce results. I want to put a question to the side that's arguing uh, that the U.S. has no dog in the fight in Syria. It looks as though what we have here basically to some degree is a disagreement about definition of terms. You have talked about um, the U.S. not having a vital interest in, in, uh, in, in getting involved in Syria. And I want to put to you the question, Just I think this allows us to go to some specifics, to look at some of what's actually happening there and ask you to tell us why that's not vital. For example, as your opponents have pointed out, uh, if Syria melts away as a state, even if with or without Assad, if it ends up being a chaotic place, uh, fueling and inviting a radicalization of a generation who would be our enemies, who would end up coming to this country with weapons, doing bad things to us, how is that not a vital interest, and why isn't it? Well, Graham a, good, a very good question. I think the... the uh, U.S. is a global power, and I think, uh, if I go back to Nigel's point just for a second, the, I think you set up a bit of a straw dog uh, with, a, with uh, respect. The notion that there's anywhere we don't care about, excuse me, we care about things in 200 countries today. Things happening everywhere impact U.S. interests. We don't sit with indifference for Sudan, for Somalia, for Pakistan, for Iraq, for any of the dozen wars that are going on now, but because the ability of the U.S., both in terms of, of uh, mind share and also capabilities, is limited. About each case, th your question, John, is right, the, qu the very right question. If Syria melts down and comes to be three states or chaotic, or more chaotic than it is today, will this be horrible? Yes. Will it have negative impacts on U.S. interests? Of course. Does it rise to the level of vital Interest. Well, does it rise to, such that does it rise to the will, does it rise a, to the level a, of justifying intervention? And right. you're saying it does doesn't. It, Why does not? Does it rise to a level of concern that would lead that would compel a responsible government to intervene militarily if that's the only way to resolve the issue? And I would say the answer is no. If Syria melts down, this will be horrible. It'll have impacts on Lebanon and on uh, and on uh, Iraq, of course. It'll <laughs> exacerbate the Sunni Shiite division, of course. All those things are also happening before Syria. Could if you, Syria could you take, I want to go to the other side first, Richard, but I just want to ask Graham to take 15 seconds. What would represent a threat to America's vital interest, just to put the marker out there? Yeah. If we look to the year ahead, Iran getting nuclear weapons. Okay, let's go to the other side. Who would like to respond, Nick Burns or Nigel Schoenwald? Nick Burns. Well, I just say this. The question is, who has a dog in the fight in Syria? Do we have one? Do we care who wins and who Wait, loses? Nigel, can you, you, I'm sorry. Uh, Nick, you made that point in your opening. I, I just want to see if you can respond to I'm responding to, to him. I'm responding yeah. right now. All right. Sounds very familiar. Good. <laughs> you try to repeat your major themes. Yeah. All right. Shouldn't Fair be. enough. <laughs> I'm really, but, really not trying to clash with you, and this I, is now the good. second time. <laughs> <laughs> we want you on our side, John. Okay. Um, 
I, I was addressing Graham's point. And, you know, we are good friends and colleagues, and I think that Graham and Richard have raised some really important points. This is not an easy choice. In fact, it's really difficult. And generally in my career, John, this answers the question, American presidents do not put American troops into harm's way unless it's a vital interest. But that's not what President Obama is trying to do. He's not trying to put American troops into Syria. In fact, he said he won't. And Nigel and I are just arguing, because of the humanitarian interests, because of where Syria is, its proximity to Israel and other countries, because of the imminent victory of Iran in a major power play, we need to be active with President Obama's plan. But it doesn't have anything to do with vital, and vital's not in that question. And, and I think the, the key disagreement, and both sides used this word, was the word lead. And this side said, this is not one where the U.S. needs to lead. This side said, the U.S. needs to lead. And quoting you, Nigel Steinwald, you can't sit this out. So I want to take that back to Richard Falkenroth, this question of, of leadership. Um, if you, there's a lot of information that's coming out of Syria now, but what the people engaged are suffering from this fighting actually think. And as far as they're concerned, we're sitting this one out. I mean, there is, there is, there, it's very clear the reporting out of Syria is the U.S. is having no impact on the ground. In fact, the narrative looks more like Al-Qaeda is having an impact and Hezbollah is having an impact, but we are not. It, it strikes me as, uh, you, you know, President Obama is stuck with no good options, uh, and this will go down in history as a failure of his policy, but he's confronted only with options which make the failure even worse. Because in order to really make an impact here, we have to make a difference on the ground. It's not enough to figure out who to write a check to or ship a bunch of light arms to. You have to figure out who are we tipping the military balance in favor of so that there's a better outcome at the end. And we are not doing that but, at this but time. But with your, I don't want to say approval, but you think that's the right choice at this point? Yes. Okay, let's take it back to Nigel Scheinwald. Well, I, I, You're very I, good with the word yes, <laughs> Nigel Scheinwald. <laughs> I just think that Rich's analysis is, is flawed and slanted in his favor because the reality is that there is a political opposition in Syria. It's fragmented, but there is a central group that all of us uh, in the United States, in Europe, in the Arab League are supporting and recognize as an alternative government. And there is a group called the Free Syrian Army that can channel arms and it could conceivably tip the balance quite quickly. Just this week, we've seen uh, examples of an attempted assassination of, of, uh, of Assad. I'm not recommending that, but it, but it happened. Um, and we've seen continued taking of territory by the, the moderate and recognized groups. I accept that there is Al-Qaeda involved, there are a whole bunch of other groups involved, but that's been the situation throughout the Middle East over the past couple of years. And in, in all those other areas, we haven't said that the Tunisian president must stay. We haven't said that Gaddafi must stay. We haven't said that Mubarak must stay. We couldn't say that um, and accept that the will of those people was just going to be completely ignored. And that's what worries me about, um, about our opponent's uh, position, that they are really arguing an old-fashioned view of real politik, keeping someone in power um, because it's the easiest option. All right, let me, look, Nigel, let me just interrupt to, to give Graham a chance to respond to some of your earlier points, uh, Graham, yeah. uh, I, I think, uh, uh, Nigel, what you're saying is, is persuasive, but, okay, the Free Syrian Army representatives and the opposition, as Rich said, a lot of Americans know them. These are guys that we meet in, in Turkey. You don't see them fighting on the ground in, in uh, Syria. So they're spending their time talking to folks like us, not having any control over 1,200 different groups are fighting independently. Uh, Chairman Dempsey said last week, in very, or, not, or two weeks ago, in very important testimony, he says, here, just a quote, about six months ago, we had a very opaque understanding of the opposition. Now I want to say it's even more opaque. <laughs> okay, Nick Burns. Uh, just a point of fact, the Free Syrian Army is inside Syria. It's commanded by General Salim Idris. Our colleague David Ignatius of the Washington Post has reported on his activities there. It's the National Coalition, the political group that, you know, goes around the world raising money, trying to raise consciousness. I would just say another thing about General Dempsey's testimony. All true, this is going to be, if, if, if the United States were to get involved, it would be difficult. But President Obama, his boss, is saying we're not going to put troops in the ground. So I think the real question here that I wanted to address to Rich and to Graham, and this is hard, is it's, it's certainly legitimate of you to say there's a risk in what you're proposing, a risk in action. But I think also the onus has to be on you to answer the question, what is the risk of inaction? 
If we do nothing, uh, do we suffer? Does, do American strategic interests suffer? And I heard a little clap over there. Uh, that's fine to, to do that. So, uh, um, and again, as I said earlier, because we're a radio broadcast, it tells the radio audience that ultimately <coughs> will hear this, uh, that you're all here. So uh, <laughs> you don't have to overdo it. But it's not like a presidential debate where you're not allowed and you have to sit on your hands. Uh, so, so that's fine. 